thankful for our holy God. Not tainted by the things that surround us in a world that has seemingly lost its mind, um, collectively lost its, its mind. I want to think that I'm someone that's not easily surprised by things I see, but daily I seem to find myself shocked by the direction and the insanity of the world we live in. Um, Collective insanity. I, I think it's just about the only way that we could describe so much of what we see. But God is holy. He defines it. He embodies it. And if we can learn to live like him, follow his instructions and his word, we also can be holy, separated unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. Man, it's good to be here today. It's good to see everybody in the house of God. Uh, I, love, I love to see that parking lot full. People fighting for parking spaces. Now, don't get carried away with that. Um, to my knowledge, we have not had a fender bender on our parking lot during church. We may have had a, a, a collision or two for other things, but... Um, so far, we've never had one for church, even with it being so difficult to park. It's not only a full parking lot, it's also uh, really tight. There's spots where you have to be careful. I want to, uh, I want to deal with today for a few moments, or at least address the condition mindset, the, the approach of current humanity to the understanding of God and the things of God. We live in a world where people really are trying, well, I don't know, I'd say it quite like that. There's a lot of talk about the things of God. There's a lot of talk on on TV, news shows, the, the debate programs, the radio. There's a lot of talk about the things of God. The problem is most of those talking don't know squat about him. Not only do they not know anything about him, They're attempting to gain any understanding that they might gain through the filter of humanism. And so it's always a failure. And it always will be a failure. So today, I don't know if it's for someone who's in this room or if it's for someone who may be joining us over the internet or someone who will watch it later. I want to talk to you about making the unknown known. Making the unknown. Changing it into something that I do know. One of the Star Trek series, the only one that I ever really watched from the 90s. The others may do this too, I I don't know. But it opens up with this majestic sounding voice over the top of video of what seems to simulate flying through space at some ridiculous speed and calls space the final frontier. Do they all do all series start out with space the final frontier or was it just the one that I watched? Any Trekkies here today? Okay, thanks. It's just the next generation. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, that much of a Trekkie. I'm just a geek. I'm not a Trekkie. Um, 
space the final frontier, the final exploration, the, the final thing that we don't know. Well, that's just ludicrous. There's always going to be something that we don't know after we learn the next thing. There will be, never be a final space. But can I tell you that faith, faith, faith in God is a much greater and a far more challenging frontier than space will ever be. If we are on this planet long enough, we will continue to improve our technology and somebody really will land on Mars at some point. There are folks who are determined billionaires who are pouring their billions into this idea that maybe mankind could somehow find a way to not just the moon, but a, literally a different planet. But I will tell you today that faith is a far greater challenge, a far more vast and expansive frontier than space will ever be. Space exploration is the exploration of something that we know exists. We just haven't been there. Faith, on the other hand, now listen to this definition is the exploration of God's promises. It's not merely the belief in God. I believe there's a God. Plenty of people say, I believe there's a God, but uh, it doesn't seem to affect their lifestyle. Plenty of people will say, I believe there's a God, but I really don't care about the things of God. At least they're honest. But if you really want to know God, if you really want to exercise faith, if you want to learn about faith, it is the exploration of God's promises. Think about that. I know there are promises in the Bible. If, if I'm a person who really does not pursue Christianity... And yet I've heard a little bit. I, I know there's promises in the Bible. I just don't know anything about them. I know they're there. I know I hear people talk about the promises of God, but, but I've never explored them. I don't know anything about them. And the only way to explore God's promises is to explore His Word. To explore is to go into the unknown and make it known. To go where you've never been so that you may learn about where you have never been. Going into the unknown so that you can return and tell now what you know. That is faith. To step into the realm of the spiritual where God's promises affect and say, I want to know more about you. I want to know whether or not you really are faithful. I want to know if these promises mean anything. There's a reason why people who don't live for God can't make sense of my life. Because they haven't been where I've been. And they do not know what I know. And until you know what I know, you'll never understand what I know. And until you've been where I've been, it won't matter how well I can describe it. Uh, there is nothing like being there. Every now and then, people try to describe a situation that was funny. And about halfway through their story of trying to make you laugh about what made them laugh, they finally just step back and say, you know what, you just had to be there. Because they're failing at the description and you're not laughing. And so they just assume, well, it's your problem. You weren't there. It may not be 
be my problem. It may be your storytelling skills. <laughs> but you cannot know what it's like to be there until you've been there. You cannot understand the power of the promises of God until you've lived through the fulfillment of one. You, you, you cannot describe the incredible experience of being in His presence until you've been there. You cannot understand what it feels like to say my sins have been washed away in the waters of baptism until you've been in the water and your faith bought into the promise that water in the name of Jesus brings remission of sin. You can't, you can't understand it. You can't describe it. Uh, you, can't, uh, you cannot understand what it feels like uh, to, to make your way to an altar of repentance uh, where you cry out uh, in sorrow, uh, in true uh, repentance. God, uh, I want to be different. Uh, you'll never understand uh, the power of that experience uh, until you have explored it. In this humanistic day, Religion is attempted to be distilled into human terms, not spiritual terms. The power, the destructive power, and the grave danger of humanism is that humanism leaves no room for the supernatural. Humanism, the pursuit of of humanity, the at times worship of humanity, the belief in the power of humanity and the ability of humanity. And while God made us with incredible ability and incredible insight and incredible power, when we use what we have learned and what we have invented, we indeed are powerful. We do exercise dominion over this, the entirety of this planet that we live on. That's all true. But humanism divorces spirituality and deity and the things that are in the realm of the supernatural completely. And so the most obvious illustration of failure will always be for a humanist to try to have a a conversation about the spiritual. Not possible. Because the humanist really doesn't believe in much in the realm of the spiritual. Even if they have an agnostic attitude of, I really just don't care. You see, you don't learn anything about faith until you explore the promises that have, have, have brought it about. You don't learn anything about walking with God until you hitch up and walk with Him. You don't learn anything about the promises of God until you buy into one and say, let's see if this works. But you cannot exercise Faith in humanity and test the promises of deity. It will never work. It will never work. Those who looking, look at faith or walking with God in humanistic terms, attempting to define faith and interaction with God in the finite realm of human understanding, are always going to be confused and will never understand the why of what I do and how I live. They're never going to understand the atmosphere of worship. They're never going to understand joy unspeakable and full of glory because humanism doesn't leave room for glory. They're never going to understand peace that makes no sense because humanism demands that everything makes sense. They're never going to understand when I sing the old song, standing on the promises of God. 
Because they're standing on 2 plus 2 is 4. And they're standing on the, the, the theorems and the ideas of Pythagoras uh, and, the, and science uh, and all of the things. Uh, Einstein's discoveries uh, and, and, and all of the science that we have learned. Uh, but listen to me. Uh, the expanse of science and the study of math uh, and the study uh, of whatever discipline uh, that is, uh, that is uh, rooted in the, in the world of humanity is never going to bring understanding realm of God. And those who look at faith in terms of humanity will always be confused. To them, the word of God is not supernatural. It is analyzed in humanistic terms uh, and they fail to understand it. They don't look at God as God. They don't look at Him as deity. They look at Him as definable, and He is not definable. They look at Him uh, as uh, measurable, and He is not measurable. They look at Him uh, as describable, and He is not describable. They look at Him uh, as understandable, uh, and He lives outside the realm of human understanding, uh, exists outside uh, of that realm, uh, and they're never going to succeed in understanding. Because you don't know until you've been there. Until you have been the explorer. Thomas Jefferson led the way to what is called the Louisiana Purchase in the early 1800s. Then they sent two very brave men. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark on an expedition called the Lewis and Clark Expedition. That was creative now, wasn't it? (laughs) And they saw things that no European Westerner had ever seen. They went places that no American had been. They encountered new peoples that no one had known. They found the Rockies and somehow found a way over them. All the way to the Pacific, exploring this new frontier that doubled the size of the United States of America. And Lewis and Clark came back, and they have written, and there has been many, 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 many writings about what they saw and what they experienced. But I'm going to tell you something. Until you've been in the Rockies, you will not understand the Rockies. Until you have stood uh, and, and looked at the majesty of Mount Hood uh, from miles away, you'll never understand it. There's no painting that's going to do that justice. Uh, there's no old engraving as they used to, uh, as they used to make uh, pictures uh, and put them in books. There's nothing that's going to do that justice. Uh, there's nothing like standing there uh, and seeing uh, the clouds uh, surround that peak as it sticks out above them. Until you have been there, until you have been the explorer, you will never understand what the explorer knows. But I'm going to tell you, every Christian that I have ever met that has explored the things of God, they know things. They know things that nobody else knows. And every Christian walk finds their way into realms that others will not find because of our conditions being different and our backgrounds and our circumstances being different. But every Christian is an explorer. Every Christian is one that looks into the word of God uh, and says I need to know more about his promises uh, and the only way to know more about his promises uh, is to try them out uh, is to test them to see and experience them the humanistic approach is never going to be able to figure God out as a matter of fact the humanistic approach looking into the word of God is going to create more confusion than understanding It is a very dangerous thing that is engulfing humanity today, this humanistic approach. Because it's hard to come back from it to the realm of faith. This book is where faith begins. It's where faith begins. And when you look at this book through eyes that are stuck on humanity, it's never going to make a lot of sense. It's never going to make sense. You will read about 
the crossing of the Red Sea in Exodus. And you will say there's no possible way that can happen because it's not quantifiable as two plus two. You will read about a sacrifice consumed by a lightning bolt on Mount Carmel and you will say it's not possible. No man can call down a lightning bolt like that with a short little simple prayer that took 30 seconds to utter. That's not going to happen. You'll never understand it when you look at it in that fashion. As a matter of fact, there are portions of the Word of God that will really mess with you. I'll show you one today from John chapter 11. Verse 4 begins like this. Now, a certain man was sick. Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, the one you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death. But it is for the glory of God that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. And then Jesus waited two days before he did anything else. I don't know what he did during those two days. But he did not go to where Lazarus was. He got word that he was sick. Why would Mary and Martha send word that he was sick except for the fact that they expected he would come? Matter of fact, that is borne out in Scripture just a few verses later. But Jesus sent him back and said, Hey, just tell her this is not unto death. But during those two days that Jesus was hanging around, he died. He died. Oh, wait a minute. Jesus, you said he wasn't going to die. You said this wasn't unto death. You said God was going to be glorified. How is God glorified by this this guy passing away? Now he's in a grave and, and everybody is weeping and mourning. How is God glorified through that? Finally, after a couple days... Jesus looks at his disciples and says, Hey guys, let's go to Judea. Judea is where the city of Jerusalem was. The city of Bethany or the town of Bethany that Lazarus and his sisters lived in was just about two miles outside of Jerusalem. And Jesus said, Boys, let's go to Judea. And his disciples piped up immediately. Wait, wait, wait. Last time we were there, they were talking about stoning you. Why do you want to go back there? They're going to kill you. Jesus kind of goes off on a tangent for a second. And then he gives him his real purpose. He said, well, our friend Lazarus sleeps and I'm going to wake him up. He didn't tell his disciples he was dead. They didn't know he was dead. Fox News wasn't broadcasting everything from every corner of the earth. Can I just tell you something right quick? The world's not a whole lot worse in tragedies and craziness than it was 30, 40 years ago. You can just know about it all now. And it makes things seem like really crazy. They ain't more crazy than they were. People are just as dumb now as they've always been. <laughs> They're doing dumb stuff just as much as they've always done dumb stuff. You just didn't hear about it. Now with its crazy internet and information superhighway, We're overloaded with negativity. Uh, I'm not even going to go down that road. I got to go wake up Lazarus. Well, Jesus, his disciples, he's got two sisters living in that house. I assume they can wake him up. I never seen a sister that couldn't wake up a brother. I'm sure, they, they, I'm sure they can wake him up. Why, why, why do you want to go and be murdered? Why do you want to go back there? If he's sleeping, they said, he'll get better. Sleep helps you heal. That's good for him. Let the man sleep, for crying out loud. Don't go wake him up. Jesus seems rather determined, finally, this incredible statement of no faith and all doubt from none other than Thomas. He says, well, you know... Um, 
If Jesus is going, guys, we might as well go and die with him. That's what he said. Let's just all go die together. Hey. He was earning that Doubting Thomas moniker long before Jesus walked through the wall. Well, let's just all go die together. You see, what you see here is a real test of faith for the disciples and for us. Because it almost looks like the Word of God contradicts itself. It almost looks like the Word of God don't make no sense. It almost looks like the things that you're reading here are contradictory to to each other and there's something wrong with this. Somebody must have made a mistake here. And you see, this is where sometimes the test of faith becomes. And this situation right here is where the wheels of humanism fall off the cart because humanism can't see past what it can't understand. And it won't embrace what it cannot understand. Faith in God believes with faith in His Word. And within the pages of this book are the promises that are to be explored. And if you want to know God, you explore His promises. If you want to know God, you explore His Word, which is full of His promises. This is a book of promise. Some see it as a book of laws uh, and a book of rules uh, and a book of, uh, of, of crazy things. But this is a book of promise. Uh, it is full of promises. Uh, it is full of guarantees. Uh, it is full of promises from the beginning uh, until the ending. Uh, it is a book of promise. Uh, humanism will look at it as a book of rules uh, because uh, they haven't explored the promises. Uh, but to the one uh, that has explored uh, and knows, uh, the unknown has become known. Uh, and I can stand and tell you today, uh, every promise promise is true. Everyone is mine. And if it hasn't come true yet, if I have not experienced it yet, I'm going to keep exploring until it does. Mountains are just mountains in the distance until you start climbing them. Promises of God are just promises in the distance until you start exploring them, checking them out, testing them, finding out who He really is. Amen. You see, for every Christian, faith begins here. If you can't believe this, uh, you'll never really have any kind of a walk with God. Uh, It is an exploration of the unknown pages of this book uh, that that begins to allow faith to exist uh, and explore or expand. Uh, It is the exploration of the promises of God's Word uh, that allows us to grow uh, and become greater and stronger Christians uh, because the more you learn, uh, the more you want to learn. The more you experience, uh, the more incredible it becomes. Uh, I believe that God is truly uh, omniscient uh, and that He is perfect uh, and so I believe that every bit of this book uh, is true uh, and accurate uh, but if you don't believe that God is true uh, and you don't believe that God is perfect uh, you'll never be able to believe that this thing is true and if I believe that God is true and I believe that God is perfect and that I believe that God is holy and righteous and I believe that everything he says is right then I will also believe that everything in this book is right and for me. There are no sections that don't matter. There are no sections that are not to be explored. There are no pages that can be torn out. There are no spots that really you can just say it's no big deal. It doesn't matter. Every bit of it matters. And if you're going to tell me I'm a Christian and I believe in God and I believe that God is true and I believe that God is perfect, then it's every bit of this book is His Word. And it's perfect in every way. That's faith. That's faith. It is, it's demanding at times because it, it, it makes us look into things that really don't make sense in the, in the eyes of humanity. But in the realm of the spiritual, what you start to see are promises unfolding that cannot be quantified, that cannot be measured, only experienced. Ha, ha. I want to experience uh, the promises, uh, but you're never going to experience them uh, without exploring them. 
And when you look at God's word as a book of promises rather than a book of rules, uh, you'll discover that it's also a book of blessings. It is a book of powerful blessing. And if I can trust uh, the reward of the book, uh, I can also trust the obediences that it requires. I'm, a, I'm just being pastor for a second. If I can say I'm a Christian, I believe in God, I believe that He's perfect, I believe that He is right. If I can say that, if I can say I believe in all the promises of this book, then I'm also going to need to be able to say I can believe that the obediences that it calls for me to engage are also right and also blessing and also intended for me. There's an old song we sang as a boy, standing on the promises of God. You know what the third verse begins with? With, uh, standing on the promises uh, that can not uh, fail. Uh, I am invested in this book. Uh, every bit of my life is about this book. Uh, I believe every bit of it. Why? Uh, because I believe that God is God. Uh, that He is perfect. Uh, he is righteous. Uh, but if you look at it through human eyes, uh, you'll never get it. You'll never understand it. <laughs> His promises won't fail. You'll never know unless you're willing to explore in faith. Paul wrote to the church he planted in Rome, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It comes by hearing. And what you hear has got to be the word of God. If you're going to have faith, you've got to have the book. Faith comes by hearing this gospel preached and experiencing the conviction that comes from the presence of God that's supernatural and can't come any other way. I don't know how many times I've seen people who walked into the doors of a church, a spirit-filled church, expecting to see a whole bunch of stuff that they could criticize and instead experiencing something that they couldn't quantify and they couldn't describe and they couldn't understand. And I don't know how many times they've looked around after church and asked somebody, what in the world did I feel in this place? What did I experience here? Because I've never felt anything like it. I'll tell you what you felt. You felt the presence of God and the birth of faith in your heart uh, when the word of God began to be preached uh, and people that believe the word of God uh, that says he inhabits the praises of his people uh, began to lift up his name uh, and those that believe uh, that where two or three are gathered in my name I will show up in their midst uh, those people that believed uh, this book uh, and the promises of it uh, engaged uh, and explored the promises uh, and you just happen to be in the middle of it experience something that can't be measured or described or understood the presence of an almighty God who exists in the realm of deity not the realm of humanity the book is a book of promises hundreds of them but they all revolve around one promise Isaiah encapsulated it unto us a child is born unto us a son is given Government should be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Isaiah further described in the 53rd of his chapter, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement, or the cost of our peace, was his to pay. Paul said, You're bought with a price, the price of the blood of Calvary. Every promise in the Bible revolves around that promise. Every promise in the Bible points to and reflects that promise. That's the one that you find from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. This promise began to unfold the moment that Adam and Eve succumbed to the temptation of the serpent's lies. We're booted out of the Garden of Eden. From that point, every major event, every major illustration, every major character, in every major person in the Bible began to point to the place where the promise would become reality, Calvary. Everything points to Calvary. They all point to Jesus in some fashion. The flood that Noah endured pointed to Jesus. The exodus from Egypt, it pointed to Jesus. The tabernacle in the wilderness, it pointed to Jesus. Jericho pointed to Jesus. 
the meteoric rise of David and the exposure of his human frailty, it all points to Jesus. The prophets all pointed to Jesus. Everything about God's Word, it points to Jesus. Every promise, they all point to Jesus. Even the name of Jesus. When you find it in the Old Testament, the significance is incredible. In the 15th chapter of Exodus, just after crossing the Red Sea, Moses began to sing a song of worship. And he said, The Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's or my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. I want to point you to a word, salvation. The Lord is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. The Hebrew word for salvation in the Old Testament is Yeshua. It's a word that many don't comprehend. So what Moses sang was, God has become my Yeshua. Everything points to Jesus. He said, my God has become my Yeshua, my salvation. It's possessive. It's my Yeshua, he said. It's not just a reference to a name, and it's important to understand this. Because when you take the Hebrew Yeshua and you bring it to the English, what you get is the name Jesus. So when Moses came up out of the Red Sea and he said, my God has become my salvation. What he said was, my God has become my Jesus. He just didn't realize what he was saying yet. David wrote the same thing twice in Psalm 118. The Lord is my strength and my song, verse 14. And he has become my salvation. It's the same word. He has become my Yeshua. He's become my Jesus. Seven verses later, he said, I will praise you in verse 21. For you have answered me and you have become my Yeshua, my Jesus. I believe you find this iteration of the word Yeshua about 70 something times in the Bible. You get to Isaiah 12. And Isaiah used up three of them. Isaiah 12 is a very long chapter. I'm going to read every bit of it. All six verses. Isaiah said, And in that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you are angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation, my Yeshua, my Jesus. I will trust Him and not be afraid for Yah. The Lord is my strength and song. A repeat of Moses. He has become my Yeshua. My salvation, my Jesus. Therefore with joy will you draw from the wells of salvation, from the wells of Yeshua, from the wells of Jesus I will draw. And in that day you will say, praise the Lord, call upon His name, declare His deeds among the peoples, make mention that His name is exalted, sing to the Lord, for He has done excellent things that is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, O inhabitant of Zion, for great, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. He has become my Jesus over and over and over. You see, the whole thing points to a promise that there is going to be a child born in Bethlehem and you're going to call His name Jesus as the angel instructed. For He shall save. He'll be salvation to His people. Shouldn't have been anything new. Isaiah had already been proclaiming, he's going to become my Jesus. So when the angel showed up and told Joseph, you name him Jesus, I wonder if the, if the wheels didn't, didn't start to turn and suddenly bells didn't ring in his head. Isaiah said, huh, huh. God's going to become my Jesus. There's something powerful about becoming Becoming describes a starting. A birth is a starting. You see, this entire book is a book of promises. A promises that affect us in everyday life. But more than anything, it is a book of a promise that says, I can be saved. That my sins can be cleansed and cured. Everything in it is fulfilled in the concept of Yeshua, which is the illustration of Jesus. 
And all of that leads to this point. If it's in this book, it's what I believe. Even when there seems to be a contradiction like we find in John 11. You see, my understanding is that the book's never wrong. So if I read something that doesn't seem to come out right, it means I need to look at it more. I need to explore it until I find the promise in its purity. When Jesus said this sickness is not unto death and yet Lazarus died anyway, what's up with that? How does that make any sense? My faith says if it seems inconsistent or contradictory, then that means I'm not seeing everything. It means I don't see everything that should be seen. You see, the word of God is not wrong. My faith says Jesus must have been referring to something other than physical death because the word of God is not wrong. You see, you've got you, you to gotta, you gotta get here. You either believe it all or you don't believe it at all. You cannot be a Christian and not embrace this entire thing. Don't tell me you're a Christian and there's sections of it you don't believe. The two are incongruent. It does not work. If you want the most vivid illustration of the humanistic approach to the church, to the things of God, catch one of these TV shows where you get somebody who wants to embrace immorality of some fashion, whatever fashion it may be, and say, we're going to try to change the way that our church believes so that it embraces our sin and makes us feel better about our immorality. That is the humanistic approach because the humanistic approach says it doesn't matter what this thing believes it ma- or what it says, it matters what I feel and how it makes you feel. And, and what it, it, it doesn't matter what this thing says, it matters what I choose to believe. I choose to believe every bit of it because he is God. And the reason I can choose to believe every bit of it is because I have explored it enough uh, that I have, I have had enough of the unknown become known to me. Uh, and you'll never understand what I know until you've been where I've been. i got to finish. Indeed, Jesus wasn't referring to physical death. He makes that clear. Because he was not interested in just merely demonstrating his power over the physical grave. He was speaking in the realm of eternity. And when he said this sickness is not unto death, he wasn't speaking of physical death. And later in the chapter, you get a conversation of the resurrection, and he illustrates that quite well. When Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Mary, I'm the reason that death can't win against a child of God. When I consider that there's about 40 authors in 66 books in this book, called the Bible, and they all correlate together, and they all tell the same story, and they all point to the same place, Calvary. Isaiah, David, both prophesying of Jesus, hundreds of years apart. Uh, Every book pointing to Calvary and beyond. It's worth exploring to find out what in the world. uh, How does this all work together? How does it all come together? Rather than picking a spot and saying, "Uh, you know what, that's just unbelievable. Uh, Why don't you explore the rest of the book? Uh, Why don't you explore the rest of what it says? Uh, And see uh, if, uh, as you read, uh, you you step back and you say, uh, I don't know how in the world these men, uh, who are thousands of years apart, uh, never knew each other, never understood each other, could write things that were about the future that they would never understand or see themselves. uh, And yet one uh, builds upon the other uh, and the other builds upon the other uh, and the prophecies come true one after the other. How does that work? Uh, You see, the exploration of the promises uh, is what will bring faith into your life. It's worth exploring. The more I explore the promises, the more they're real that they become We get a complete understanding of this incident in John chapter 11. I'm wrapping up with this. Musicians, you can join me. The last verses of the chapter. Jesus showed up at the home of this family. They're mourning the loss of their brother. Mary comes out to Jesus and said, Lord, if you'd just been here sooner. Jesus, if you had just gotten here two days ago, when you should have got here, when I told you to come, Jesus said, Mary, Lazarus will live again. Oh, I know he will. I know he'll live in the resurrection. But Mary, I am the resurrection. Not only that, I'm the life. Not just life. I am the life. Then the context is found. Starting in verse 25, Jesus has not really been talking about the physical near as much as the spiritual. 
He said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. The problem with that statement is it doesn't add up. Two plus two doesn't work here. And to the humanist eyes, the wheels fall off. But to the one who's been filled with the Spirit, to the one who has hope beyond the day and the grave, it makes perfect sense. To the one who has lived Paul's words that says, I die daily. To the one that has lived the words of the Bible that says, if I, I'm crucified with Christ and yet I live. To the one that has explored the promises that life uh, is in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. To the one who has explored the promises and discovered that they're true. That you can have joy unspeakable. That you can have peace that makes no sense. Uh, To the one that has tested these things out. uh, This makes great sense. Perfect sense. Uh, To the one that's never walked in the realm of faith. uh, It never seems to add up. Lord, if you've just been here a little bit sooner. Jesus said, Mary, he who believes in me has faith in me. Though he may die, he'll live. It's a spiritual life. It's eternity. Whoever believes in me shall never die. You can die on the earth, but you never die in the spiritual. The reality is the realm of faith is never going to be explored with math or science or humanistic pursuits of, of, of understanding. Instead, faith is going to be a journey into the unknown. And the future is always unknown. The next step in faith is still always unknown. You never exhaust The journey never ends. Today I came to tell somebody, faith is not something that you can define, nor is it something you can quantify. It's a journey that you embark on. And if you want a humanistic definition of what it means to be a Christian, if you want a quantifiable, definable understanding of what it means to walk with God, you will always be disappointed. Stand this morning. But I'm going to guarantee you right now, When you embark on the journey of exploring the promises, you won't be disappointed. You won't be disappointed. I'm, I'm with you. I could easily go down the humanistic road. I'm an analytic. I think math and science are cool, fun, interesting. I, I always want to know why. I want to know why in terms of numbers and definable processes, quantifiable, finite realities. I want to know why. I love to know why. And I love to learn things that I've not known before. Which is why I love to walk with God. Because the further I walk, more real he becomes the more steps I take the more I want to take the further I go the greater he becomes the more I experience the more I want the more I see the more I want to see the more I know the more I want to know and while I may not ever get understanding I always want more I want to know So if you really want to understand faith, friend, you're going to have to to say, you know what, I'll try this this journey out. I'll try this exploration out. I will try. I will explore these promises. Uh, You may not ever be able to quantify them, uh, but I'm going to tell you, you can experience them. Uh, You may not ever be able to describe them, uh, but you can live them. Uh, You may end up trying to tell somebody about it and finally just say, you know what, you just had to be there. Uh, Because if you haven't been where I've been, uh, you can't know what I've known. Uh, If you've not experienced what I've experienced, You cannot understand why I am who I am. But if you want to know, you can. You can. You just got to explore the unknown pages of this book. Looking for promises that will come true in your life. Lord, I I pray right now the Holy Ghost would just grip some hearts and lives. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would minister into the lives of people in this room. 
Some, Lord, that, that indeed have tried to test you, that have, have tried to quantify, have tried to gain understanding. Uh, Lord, someone that may be watching this message from afar, uh, even, even overseas, uh, I pray right now that, that somehow your presence uh, would fill whatever room they're in uh, and that you would begin to minister into the, into the heart of someone uh, whose faith is jaded, uh, whose, uh, whose attitude towards you, uh, Lord, uh, is one of, uh, I'm not, not going to mess with that which I can't understand. And uh, I pray, Lord, instead your spirit uh, would just begin to stir up something in theirs. In Jesus' name. Until you've been where I've been, you're not going to understand what I know. Until you've walked in my steps, you're not going to understand my response. Until you've explored what I've explored. You cannot possibly know what I know. But you can join me on the journey. And we can explore the promises together. And we can prove them over and over and over. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Because I've proved him over and over and over. I wonder today if as a church we could journey our way down here into this altar for a moment, lift up our hearts toward God and begin to seek Him. And this morning, if I have if I have described you in some fashion, I want to know more about God, but I'm really struggling with the with this whole faith thing, with believing every bit of this. Friend, I don't expect you to believe the whole book today. I just want you to try out a promise or two. Because the more promises you find and you try out, uh, the more you're going to want to find. Uh, and before long, this book won't be a book. Uh, it will be a treasure. Uh, before long, this won't be a, a book of laws and rules. Uh, it'll be a book of promises uh, that you uh, can't wait to open again and say, give me another promise. Uh, show me another promise. Uh, I want one more for my life and my heart. Give me another promise for my family. Give me another promise for my home. Give me another promise for my kids. Listen, there's always going to be people that will be people that won't understand you. There's always going to be people that will criticize Christianity, that will challenge everything about it, that will say, it doesn't make sense the way you live. That's fine. They're never going to understand why I live the way I do until they have journeyed in my journey, until they have experienced what I've experienced. They're never going to understand.